And we're back. We're live. Yes, that test worked out okay. So it looked okay. It sounded okay. I got a request by someone to do some music, hence the, the guitar here, but we made on that. I, what I really wanted to do is report back from uh, the symposium and continue what saying in part one of this report uh, at the MTC report channel. Uh, I wanted to let you know that Catherine Feiner from The Guardian had some really great things to say. And I think I, I like the model that The Guardian has adopted. It's, of course, not uh, the only model, and it's not maybe the optimum one yet. Uh, a lot of different media organizations are struggling with this idea of how to adopt a model for funding that will get people paid, you know, so that they can pay their bills and continue to do journalism. Um, and this, in the face of a lot of, um, a lot of, layoffs, uh, mass layoffs across the country, in the United States, uh, in major newspapers and other media outlets. So a lot of crowdsourcing for information now. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a great time for journalists. And yet at the same time, it's the most important time for us to be here to speak out, I think. And that's uh, very well in evidence at this symposium. Um, and I really do have to give credit to the Knight Foundation for allowing this to happen because it allowed uh, people who normally may not have con um, contributed or participated in a symposium like this to actually be here in virtually and participate, which is really cool in um, these discussions and what's going on at the International uh, Symposium on Online Journalism. Uh, by the way, Reporters Without Borders just released uh, their um, newest 21, 2021 uh, World Press Freedom Index report on press freedom around the world. And uh, as I'll just give you that as a teaser, and I won't tell you what the result is at the moment, but um, last year, the United States was ranked 48th in the world in terms of press freedom. So there you go. It's not necessarily um, a, uh, it's not necessarily a place um, where everybody <laughs> is doing great in terms of press freedom. The United States has a lot of problems and it has to do with the corporate control of the media, not necessarily uh, state controlled media, although they kind of go hand in hand at times. Um, but there's also a lot of secrecy in the government here and um, lack of access to information about the workings of our own government. Uh, there's been a, you know, a, a surveillance regime and secrecy regime for a while here. Um, so those things are, make it difficult. Uh, we just, you know, had a, uh, chief, chief of state, basically, uh, the president, um, previously was very anti-press and, you know, um, talked a lot about the press being the enemy of the people and all sorts of things. So we really have to avoid that kind of rhetoric because press freedom is what the, you know, part of what the United States was founded on in terms of the U S constitution, at least, um, the bill of rights, uh, you know, first amendment. Um, allows for freedom of the press. And that means that people need to be allowed to speak. And uh, so we need to protect that right and protect the journalists who do that. Um, the International Symposium um, on Online Journalism is taking place all week. So you can look forward maybe to a few more reports of these. Maybe I might do one every day after the, the, the symposium and uh, let folks know what's going on. And then of course, these are archived at my YouTube channel. So you don't need to be here live to see these, which is great because I know people have really busy schedules. And especially when it's an internet and an, an international conference, there are people from many different time zones participating. So it gets really complicated in, in terms of trying to coordinate and interact with people. Um, I love the idea of archiving pe people's works. Um, I you know, really stress that with my artist friends and also my journalist friends. Uh, it's very important that you get the information out there and allow it to be available. By the way, a good place to do that is Internet Archive. Um, that is a good place, uh, so check it out. Um, it does some have some kind of sustaining uh, longevity to it, I think, because it, you know, although it is crowdfunded, it's also supported by a lot of libraries and uh, institutions that I, you know, I'm going to hope will, you know, keep that site alive and keep those archives going. And you can often find video and audio in multiple formats. Um, a lot of also uh, public domain, interesting public domain films and um, documentaries and films and things from the past. So 
very interesting place to go. Also a good place to archive your stuff, whether you're a journalist uh, or uh, not. And then, you know, there are many other platforms that we're all using uh, technologically. And that was another uh, issue today that people were talking about. But before I get to that, cybersecurity, you know, that was um, a major issue. And one of the uh, workshops today, one of the panels, and, you know, you can see why, because in these days uh, of um, internet hacking, and you know, it's difficult. Um, uh, so one of the workshops was how to develop secure communication with sources. And so a lot of people, uh, a lot of institutions like, you know, the bigger ones, New York Times and others use um, a sort of Dropbox system for whistleblowers and try to find ways of uh, communicating with people securely. So that's a very important thing. And I'm not going to go into the details of it. You can actually, you know, go on uh, the ISOJ um, web uh, channel, actually, on um, YouTube and get those yourself and check that out. And if you are a journalist, uh, highly recommend that you check out all of these videos or as many of them as you can. This is a five day event. So things are happening all week long. And I know not everybody has that much time in their uh, schedule for this kind of thing, but everything is being archived on uh, YouTube. So, you know, you can check it out. You don't have to be there at eight o'clock in the morning Pacific time or whatever to hear the keynote address. Um, but these events have been starting in the morning and going on all day long, just like a normal symposium would. And then, uh, for instance, today, um, there was the keynote session with Catherine Viner, editor-in-chief of The Guardian, uh, which we talked about the contribution model uh, that they've adopted at The Guardian, which has been highly successful, actually. Um, without a paywall, they have been able to um, gain garner support from people who just really appreciate progressive or independent media and want um, to contribute to what they're doing there. So that model has worked for them and has been highly successful. Um, so it's very interesting hearing from Catherine about that. Um, she's right in the middle of all of that and, and knows exactly what that's about. So um, we also heard from the editor in chief from the San Francisco Chronicle, um, Emilio Garcia Ruiz, and then a workshop on how to develop uh, ways of dealing with mis and disinformation which is of course a big issue these days a, a larger and larger issue i actually participated in a european uh Euro a european union um conference on that where uh there was a lot of discussion of misinformation and disinformation and how media can fact check and um make sure that people are getting accurate information because there's a lot of disinformation out there and people base their entire careers on creating mis and disinformation and propaganda. Um, if there's big money in it, um, a lot of, you know, one of the discussions was about how people like to attract audiences that way by being controversial or conspiratorial and then building these sort of house of cards, but that are very alluring to people so that they continue to support them. It's a way of attracting an audience. Um, I, know, I know a journalist who has done that. So, I've seen it with my own eyes. You know, sometimes people will change their stripes uh, politically and otherwise in order to adopt, uh, you know, uh, a type of media that will attract a larger audience, whether it's real information or not. Um, so one was one panel um, was a peer-reviewed research panel, which was about capturing journalism's evolution from algorithms to misinformation and how all of that works uh, in the modern online media. Because, you know, let's face it, everything is pretty much digital these days. As I predicted years ago, everything is kind of coming down to one uh, platform, one format at least, um, and whether it's your, your handheld device or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we don't have the Dick Tracy watches so much. Um, and video, actually video conferencing and teleconferencing is still now catching on after years and years of being used. I mean, it's it's been around forever, but for some reason, uh, people have not adopted it in their daily lives as much as people had predicted in the past, you know, with the old Jetsons, you know, video phone and stuff. Um, and living in Seattle where the Space Needle is located, I know all about the Jetsons, right? Because um, <laughs> it's basically uh, the Jetsons, uh, the way they lived was just like living on the Space Needle. Um, but that was part of the Century 21 thing that happened during the World's Fair here. And it, oh, I'm getting a call in, but never mind. Um, 
it predicted a future where people used a lot of video phones um, and, you know, it did predict an information age where people used a lot of uh, computers and, you know, they usually had robots or computers um, fixing your dinner or something, which never really happened. But before we go off on that tangent, um, it was, you know, a series of uh, sessions yesterday started with A.G. Sulzberger, who's the chairman and publisher of the New York Times. So um, also the president and CEO of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation was the chair of that original that morning session. So. There was uh, the workshop called Lessons from the Global South, How Innovation Has Helped Newsrooms Around the World, which I highly recommend people check about check out. Um, there's not enough coverage of international news in the United States, as I said earlier in part one of this report. Um, that's, but there's so many innovative ideas and things that people are doing right on the ground to get news and information out there. It's, it's amazing. Um, so, you know, technology is a double-edged sword. You have people who are using it to try to propagandize you. And then you also have people who are actually breaking real information and news, which can be very effective in changing public policy and people's um, consciousness and opinions. Um, there was a panel uh, in midday about collaborative journalism networks. Uh, it was called The Lone Wolf Investigative Reporter Joins Regional and Global PACs. So how do people collaborate on their journalism projects? How do these networks um, form and what are their uses and are they effective? You know, is it a good idea? Um, I'm safety in numbers. Um, also, you know, people have access to information you may not. And it's always good to have a, a collaborative effort going on. There's more people, you know, to pick up and run with the balls, so to speak, to use a sports metaphor. Um, at, the evening session there on the first day, which was Monday, there was a panel on community management and audience engagement, which was about turning the news into a conversation with your community. And I think that's one of the most important things uh, that have been brought up here at this symposium is uh, I was in the chat room during that uh, panel discussion saying, yes, yes, you know, let's talk, let's talk more about this because uh, you really, as a journalist, need to engage in your community. I mean, a lot of reporters I know, and I'm not going to mention names, who just kind of sit in an ivory tower at their, you know, big corporate newspaper or whatever, and don't really engage in the community much. They don't they don't show up at city council meetings as a citizen or resident of the city. Um, they don't pay attention to local news and talk to local business people and people living in the neighborhood. So I think that's really missing um, if you want to do authentic journalism. Um, if you want to do corporate journalism and, you know, you know, 30 second soundbite journalism, that's a different thing. But if you really want to, if you're in it for the long haul and you want to do in-depth journalism and understand the community that you're living in, then you need to engage in it and you can't hide from it. And you can't um, pretend it doesn't exist and just work for some corporation. You really need to like be a part of your community to understand what's happening in people's daily lives. That's very important if you're a journalist, I think. And that of course is going to create some empathy, but it's a good kind of empathy because you will understand what people really need in your community and how they're suffering and how they're benefiting or not. Um, and then you can help educate the public about that. And it might you know, bring about changes in the old days when Walter Cronkite was working for a major newspaper, he was, he said that the editor would just hit on a story every day, some issue that they felt wasn't being addressed in the community. They would write editorials every day and every day and every day and call out the politicians and, and try to bring them into the discussion. And, finally, you know, and they wouldn't stop until something changed. And that's activism journalism, advocacy journalism. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're, if the facts are true and, you know, people need your help and uh, they need the help of their political representatives and other people in their community, then you got to tell that story and get the news out there. That's my personal opinion. I'm not speaking for the, you know, the um, workshop panelists. That's, that was my, um, message to them basically is that I think it's very important that uh, people interact with other people in the community. Um, these days, a lot of it is happening virtually, but you know, um, there's also, uh, there was a welcome party and happy hour after all of this on the first day, which is very interesting because we're living in an age of social networking platforms and engagement platforms and virtual platforms where uh, people are actually having parties so to speak, um, in a virtual environment. And that's what it, what it has been. Um, Shindig is one of the platforms and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not sponsored by Shindig and I'm not um, advertising for them or anything. That just happens to be the platform that the International Symposium on Online Journalism used 
for this uh, gathering, and it was a welcome party, happy hour, and then you know encouraged people to you know be why they're ob be why ob at home, you know have their own alcohol, a glass of wine, or whatever you want at home, and your food, and then just get on your webcam and talk to other people during these uh, social engagement events. And one was a really great uh, singer songwriter um, artist. Um, from Austin, Jackie, she was really good. So I recommend that you thank you, Jackie and Austin for that beautiful music. And I hope you get a chance to see this video so you can get that shout out for me because you deserve it. I'm a musician, so I love what you did. It was so beautiful seeing you play that Epiphone, um, Les Paul, mm, that was nice. Anyway, um, so that's the first two days. And my impression overall is that it's been very, informative, very helpful. I think the discussions have been the most important thing because all of this is cutting edge. So instead of having people shake their finger and lecture you like in journalism school about what you should or shouldn't do, of course, you know, journalism ethics is always at the top of the, um, the list of topics, you know, we need to focus on. Um, but I think discussion is what's important right now in the fact that the new technologies are changing journalism, the different platforms are changing um, people are approaching journalism differently. It's being funded differently. There's a whole new media revolution going on that um, people need to understand if you want to be a reporter, even f at your local news uh, TV or radio station, you really need to understand the technology that people are using these days and the platforms that people use to get that information out. So technology is really important. You know, there's a challenge, of course, in keeping the technology from becoming the overriding influence on your life and, you know, causing you not to have uh, time to actually do investigative journalism or something. I mean, it's important that sometimes you just have a pencil and a piece of paper or something. I mean, I know that's very old school, um, uh, but it's, you know, there's certain things about journalism that I don't think technology can, can, can replace. For instance, the fact that from my point of view, you know, to be a good journalist, you have to be curious. You have to be, intellectually curious, you know, and, and try to want to understand things around you and what's going on in the world and then convey that to other people, what you've learned. Um, there is an educational aspect to all journalism. And we've, of course, recognized that more and more recently. There's a certain responsibility as well in terms of accuracy, because what you report affects other people's lives. And that is a professional responsibility that you must take very seriously and be very careful what you report. Always fact check, fact check, fact check, fact check. Okay. Um, multiple, multiple times, not just once or twice, multiple, multiple times. Um, and, you know, try not to let trying to break the news um, cause you to release information that may not be completely accurate. You know, I mean, I know everybody wants that scoop, um, but accuracy is, is a responsibility to the community in general. So, uh, that's the first two days, and we've got day three coming up. And that's going to be interesting because you've got the co-founders of Punchbowl News are going to be speaking. And then Evan Smith, the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune, is going to be speaking because it is sponsored partly through the auspices of the Texas, uh, the University of Texas at Austin, which is a great town for music, by the way, which is why the music has been so amazing. I really appreciate that, that Austin artists have contributed to the soundtrack that they're um, playing for us and um, and the online uh, performance yesterday, last night was really great from Austin. Um, it's a great music for a great city for music. And as a musician, I have a lot of respect for that city. I wish, you know, Seattle, it's a great mu music city too. Um, New Orleans, you know, Nashville, there's so many places, New York City, Chicago, so many great places, LA, where music um, is, is really important. And it's important to our culture. So so there's going to be a keynote session tomorrow. It's called Reinventing Online Political Coverage. Um, and then, you know, if more informational uh, uses of uh, informational platforms. Um, uh, immersive journalism, VR and AR, and how they're adding new dimensions to storytelling. Um, all sorts of stuff that I think is important, you know, for all journalists, but also for people who maybe have never even considered being a journalist. But um, in the next few days, there's going to be a few more keynote speakers and workshops, including one covering about covering climate change. There's going to be um, 
uh, the growth of opinion in online journalism is one of the topics for discussion. There's a panel on race and equity in the news, which is super important at the top of everybody's list of, of subjects to focus on this year, and hopefully always reporting in service of communities and with the URL uh, uplift, respect, and love lens is what they're calling that. So there's another re peer reviewed research panel called Challenging the Status Quo New Pathways to Understanding News Audiences Today. And then another happy hour party towards the end. So um, Marty Barron is the former executive editor for the Washington Post. He's been um, in on a lot of this. Um, and as I said, we had the chairman and publisher of, uh, of the New York Times and Catherine Viner, the editor in chief of The Guardian. Uh, so some real interesting people who are giving their time, you know, to, to reach out to the journalism community at large. Some amazing people um, from all over the world. Uh, and if you go to the panel on collaborative journalism networks, you'll see that uh, there's Colombia is represented there, Kenya, Lebanon, Italy. Um, very interesting international conversation going on here. And as I said, I think the conversation is the most important um, thing about what's happening here is that we as journalists and editors and publishers need to talk to each other and need to understand what's going on in the world in terms of the technology, how it's changing things and how people are using media differently these days and how so much is becoming an online phenomenon. So I don't know if there's anything more I need to report from today's episode. I actually got out and believe it or not, got a chance to get out on the water because it was a really beautiful day um, and row for a while, which was cool. But somebody called me and said, play some music, Mark. And I don't think the mic necessarily or the the camera is set up to do this necessarily, but I'm going to try something here. Talk, that's all. Mr. Boss Man, 
won't you hear us when we call? Mr. Boss Man, won't you hear us when we call? I said, now you ain't so big. You just talk, that's all. So I had to play that because it was a request. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to warm up, so, you know, but it was kind of easy, so that's okay. Um, but yeah, I'm also a musician, so uh, that's a whole other issue is the arts and uh, politics, but we can talk about that uh, probably on another live stream. Um, but right now, I'm going to probably do another report Nick tomorrow about the International Symposium on Online Journalism and let you know what goes on there. It seems like uh, it's a good thing happening. And there's a lot of people that are participating and it has an international feel to it. So I'm appreciating that very much. And for the rest of you out there who haven't had a chance, you can check out all of those sessions online at YouTube at the uh, ISOJ 2021 channel and it'll give you uh as soon as the sessions are done i think they're posting them so uh a lot of these are zoom conferences and then they immediately uh, post them to youtube so you can check it out right after it's done and you can watch it on youtube live so you don't have to actually have a, a zoom account or interact you know in a, a video conference um call if you don't want to um there are some some of us who do we you know we're on the zoom conferences with the the panelists and things but you don't have to do that you can watch it anytime you want and you don't have to interact with any kind of a, a video camera or anything like that or microphone so i want to thank you for joining this live stream this is uh, mark taylor canfield from seattle for the mtc report uh, reporting on the international symposium on online journalism and uh feel free to subscribe and click the little thing down there i think it's down there called the it's an, a little icon that says uh, MTC report that'll help that'll subscribe you to this channel and each time we release something like the segments that I do every week um, on the Jeff Santo show talking about uh, politics music culture um, we will you know we post those immediately uh, or within a few days at least of the of the show so we try to make those available and um, as far as my music you can hear me at SoundCloud. I have an account called Mark Taylor Canfield One there. And that is where my latest music is posted. So you can check out the rock music and the classical music that I'm composing and all sorts of stuff there. Um, I'm on Twitter, of course. Uh, as a journalist, we're all on Twitter, it seems like. And then um, also on Facebook and Instagram and then YouTube. So I hope you all are having a great day. And uh, I look forward to another day. Uh, oh, this is going to be five days uh, of this symposium. So whew, I hope everybody's getting a lot of sleep and eating. All of you out there at the symposium, and taking care of yourselves. And maybe I can provide a little music at the end of the day. Um, if you come back to this channel and uh, I can entertain you as you relax for the evening. So check it out tomorrow. I'll probably be back, be back live around the same time. Um, about five o'clock, I guess, p.m. Pacific time to give a wrap up of tomorrow's day's events. And until then, take care, everybody. Peace out. We'll see you tomorrow.